So we arrived at the uh, at the fact that the matrix, the coefficient matrix that we arrive at in the deconstruction problem has a special structure. It's a sum of a Toeplitz and a Hankel matrix and moreover this Hankel matrix is not any old uh, Hankel matrix, it's actually a a Hankel matrix whose elements are derived from the Toeplitz matrix in a very special way as I explained. And it happened to look like that. Right. Um, so the nice thing is that for such matrices there is a fast algorithm that can deal with them and that is called the discrete, discrete cosine transform Right, so it turns out that by means of the discrete cosine transform you can diagonalize a matrix that has this uh, symmetric Toeplitz plus Hankel matrix structure. Now let's see, how to describe that? I describe it here in a linear algebra setting and perhaps it could also be done in a signal processing uh, setting. Right, so let's see, how to get started? We define a matrix Wn here, it's an n by n matrix, it's an orthogonal matrix and I'm not telling you precisely how I define the elements of that matrix but it's defined in such a way that when you multiply with that matrix transpose on a, a given vector it computes the discrete cosine transform of that vector. Right. So, so uh, and we don't really need to know what that matrix is, but it can be worked out what that matrix is. But, so anyway, whenever we see multiplication with Wn transpose, uh, it's, it's just a discrete cosine transform, and then when we actually want to do a discrete cosine transform, of course, uh, we do it in MATLAB by means of the built-in function that is called DCT. Right. Okay. But here's the, here's the cool thing. Okay, assume you actually formed that matrix, then it turns out that the columns of that guy are actually um, associated with the eigenvectors of the uh, symmetric Toeplitz plus Hankel matrix. Isn't that cool? So, so we can always write, uh, here's our matrix that is symmetric, Toeplitz plus Hankel, we can always write it in this form here, so on the left is Wn, then there's uh, on the right is Wn transpose, and then there's a diagonal matrix sitting in the middle. So this is an, this is an eigenvalue decomposition, and in fact the, um, the columns of Wn are the eigenvectors of that matrix, and the diagonal matrix here, how do you actually compute the, those diagonal elements, well basically uh, you can compute them by means of that, that relation sitting there. I'm, kinda, I'm not going to derive why that is so, but you see you only need to do a couple of, of DCT computations and then you have the diagonal elements of that matrix. So, you have an, a matrix, you have a diagonal matrix and you have a matrix again that is the inverse of the first one and it's actually a transpose here because it's an orthogonal matrix, so that is the eigenvalue decomposition. And now this is, one interesting thing here is really that all STH matrices, all matrices that are symmetric, Toeplitz plus Hankel, have the same eigenvectors. Because you see, this matrix here only depends on the size of the matrix, but not on the actual elements in A. Isn't that amazing? So, so, uh, so, so, so where, where, where does that uh, freedom uh, go that you, 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 of course, you can choose any A that is uh, STH, well that goes into the uh, uh, eigenvalues, of course what you have here in the middle are the eigenvalues that you can com compute in this fashion here. So that, that is actually quite nice, All right. And, uh, right, right. So to compute the, these, these matrices you, you don't really have to compute because whenever you multiply with them you're just doing a DCT or an inverse DCT and the eigenvalues you don't really have to compute, use an eigenvalue solver to get them you just use that relation there again everything costs n log n operations so so that's quite nice. All right. 
and then we can plug that in and it, it for example it means that we basically basically we've got, also got the singular value decomposition once we've got the eigenvalue decomposition the only thing is that of course no one says that these uh, the, uh, eigenvalues of the matrix are, are, are uh, guaranteed to be uh, non-negative but singular values are non-negative so if we want the singular value decomposition then we can pull out the signs of the uh, eigenvalues in a diagonal matrix here which has just plus and minus ones we can pull them out and then we can t keep the absolute values right here on the diagonal and then we can pull out uh, this sign matrix here either to the to the left or to the right here I, I pull it to the left so what we have here is really the singular value decomposition we put the sign changes over here now we have non-negative elements in the middle and we have another matrix here so that's the singular value decomposition right, but of course it you know when we do the actual computations we don't really think about that sign we just think of this as a pseudo singular value decomposition where the singular values can have both positive and negative sign yeah right and uh, so let's see let me back up here right yeah well we have this, yeah let's think of this as a as a like a, a pseudo singular value decomposition so so what are we going to do here now we're going to compute a filtered regularized solution let me do that here on the board so if we have a singular value decomposition then of course our regularized solution will be something like why should I write that our regularized solution will be V and then there will be a diagonal filter matrix it'll be Sigma inverse it'll be U transpose and then times B right so let's do the same for uh, for this particular case here this is now the coefficient matrix and we can write it like this W N D W N transpose so again let's write out our regularized solution in terms of that so that'll be W N again we need to define a filter matrix there that could be zeros and ones then we'll have like a truncated SVD or it could be the ones corresponding to Tikhonov regularization and we're going to have our D inverse W N transpose and then our right hand side B right that's all we need to do and that's what we have there on top there right and the thing is that now we, 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 we look at this expression here and then we start to recognize uh, computations that we want to do so I, I already mentioned that when you multiply WN transpose to a vector that's actually computing the DCT so this guy here is DCT of B so so instead of actually forming that matrix there and multiplying you just call the MATLAB function DCT of B and then you have that vector sitting right there right and then I already told you how to compute the uh, elements of D so that's the, the specific MATLAB code that we have here we do this uh, computation here two DCTs and then we get a vector here that holds these eigenvalues okay so we have those the filters there let's assume we are doing Tikhonov regularization well basically they will be the eigenvalues element divided by here the eigenvalue squared plus lambda squared lambda being the regularization parameter right. so let's see this is a diagonal this is a diagonal so all this is just diagonal of that vector Q that we have right there and uh, okay so we have a vector there we have a diagonal matrix 
here with Q. So of course, when we multiply those two, it's just really uh, going to be another a, a, a vector whose elements are Q element-wise multiplication with dct of b. I hope you can see that. So again, this is a vector, and then we multiply with Wn, and that's the inverse uh, discrete cosine transform. So in the end, to do this, you do I dct of that guy there, and that's what we have there. Right. Right, 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 right. So that's how to compute a filtered regularized solution, really, really efficient. Because all it requires is four, four DCTs. One there, one there, one there, and, and one there. So everything, everything here is n log n computations. So that's, that's really fantastic, in my opinion, <laughs> that, that you can do this so efficiently. Another nice thing is that then if you come with a problem with a different right hand side but the same coefficient matrix then you already have the D and the Q and then you just have to, to compute the last line here so it's only two uh, DCGs. So anyway, it's pretty fantastic. Right, so again an example that, you know, look for structure. Look for structure in the problem. See if you can utilize it in your computations. Here the thing is that the um, right, so originally we, we had a, a toplets matrix um, coming from, from a deconvolution problem. So deconvolution problems and toplets matrices go hand in hand. And then this additional structure here we got from reflexive boundary conditions. So when we, we add reflexive boundary conditions to pr uh, convolution and deconvolution, then we get matrices with this symmetric topless plus Hankel structure, and, and again, we can, we can do computations fast. So yeah, I think that's pretty amazing. Let's talk about the, the last problem here, because I also want to go a little bit into something I call depth resolution. So this is an example how looking at the singular, not just the singular values, but also the singular vectors, gives us an idea of what we can actually hope to, to reconstruct. All right. So, so we have already talked about the fact that very, very often the singular vectors have this, uh, like a, they act like a spectral basis. The higher the index, the more oscillations we have in the singular vectors, but, but sometimes they contain additional structure that, is, that can be very, very useful. So I'm going to illustrate that again with a 1D example, and in the book we also describe how to, that carries over to a, a two-dimensional example. Right. So this is related to something I, I found, a paper about this, uh, about depth profiling by means of a technique that's called PIXA. Uh, Particle-induced X-ray emission spectroscopy. Right. So let's see. What? What? What's the? I really don't know very much about the physics, of course, behind this. But I can try to illustrate what the basic idea is. Okay. Here's a surface. Assume you're looking at a painting, and you want to know maybe the artist actually painted something else. Uh, b b below before he, he finalized his picture. So you want to see inside a painting, for example. So there could be different layers of paint here. And you can see what, what, is, what is underneath Mona Lisa or whatever. Now we are looking at a 1D problem associated that. So we put, a, we put an axis right here. And now for this particular location, we are interested in knowing uh, the different layers right here. So that's what we are going to be doing. Okay, and what do we do? We, we put a sensor here. Or a sensor, how, how do you spell that? And uh, so what do you do? And then you have an X-ray source.
So you send x-rays into this structure here with the different layers and from, from the different layers you get reflections that are sent back into this into the, the detector. Since I can't spell sensor let me call it a detector. Okay. So what are you trying to reconstruct? You're trying to reconstruct material properties as a function of depth. Okay, so you're going to have a this is going to be your t-axis and you're trying to reconstruct some some function that lives from here to there, some function that describes material properties. f of t, that's the unknown, right? And what you vary is the angle of incidence there, so that's the, uh, it's called s here. So you, you, can, you, can, you, you can send in x-rays from, from, uh, from different directions here and measure the signal here. So, so that's, the, that, that's, the other, that's the other variable here. And of course, you have the x-ray intensity. So, so that's what you're doing. That's, uh, so again, you, ha you have a, a first kind uh, integral, Fredholm integral equation, all right? It looks like that, right? Basically, the, the, right, the, <laughs> the measured signal is of course up here but depends on the angle here of the x-ray. Okay. So that is related to the function f, the function living here that describes the material parameters in this way here, right? So that's an inverse problem and you can write it out in the usual way if you define your kernel like this. So, right, we could do that. I created a test problem described like this and um, yeah here's some here, here's the here's the test problem and here are some here are some um, some reconstructions so my exact function that I'm trying to reconstruct is the red guy here and it was constructed in such a way that it has uh, three humps so like one particular layer of, of paint, say, close to the surface, another one further down, and yet another one even further down. And then we compute regularized solutions by means of truncated SVD, and I show the solutions here for different uh, truncation parameters, 20, 40, 60, and so on and so forth. And, uh, right, yeah, we should only look at the, at the top plot here. Uh, and, and oh yeah, the, t the top and the bottom is just for two different noise levels. Here there's more noise than here. So anyway, we get, we get, we get interesting reconstructions. It, turns, it seems that, you know, for a, a low value of the truncation parameter, we can definitely construct basically the first peak here, uh, but, but we don't see the, the other two peaks. And then as we increase the truncation parameter, so we include more and more SVD components, then apparently here we can see a second hump is probably there. But when we go even further, uh, the noise is coming in and we, 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 we just can't see anymore. Here with the lower noise level, uh, right here the noise level is of the order 10 to the minus five. Here it's 10 to the minus six essentially. And, 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 and then it turns out that we can include at least 80 SVD components in the, in the solution and we definitely uh, uh, reconstruct the, the two humps, the two first humps are well constructed, but then noise starts to come in and maybe a second, a th the third hump is building up there, but it's not really safe to say whether it's there or not. So, so it's, it's quite interesting. So let's see, how, how do we actually arrive at that? Well, we take this model here, we discretize this guy here into a, into a matrix with a, a very interesting uh, structure because it, it will have a, a number of zeros in there because of that condition there. There we go. That's how the matrix elements are defined. And then we can discretize. And that's what I did, of course. And it turned out that when I 
just discretize naively, I get a singular value. These are the singular values of that particular matrix with a, an equidistant spacing of the quadrature points in T. So that would be points here, along here, and along that T axis. And unfortunately, that matrix there is certainly rank deficient. It has a rank approximately like 200, okay? So, I don't know, I wasn't too happy with that. I thought I could do better. And, uh, and the first thing, well, one thing that should come to mind is perhaps we could do a variable transformation. We are free to actually change variable and, uh, and then discretize uh, in, 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 the, in the new variable. Um, and that's what we do here. So I say my, my variable t here, the depth, is actually sine of tau, and then tau is going to be my independent variable instead. And then, of course, when you change variables, your integral look just a little bit different. We get this cosine tau now in there, but that's all right. And if we discretize like that, we suddenly get, so we have matrix elements that are now should, uh, computed in this way here, but the very nice thing now is that if we have points that are equidistant in tau, but they are not equidistant in, in t anymore because t is sine of tau, then we have a, a, a more well, well less ill-conditioned problem, I would say, because now suddenly the matrix is not rank deficient. The, the null space went away. Right. So that's interesting. I mean, null spaces is something we don't like because we cannot recover anything that lies in the null spaces. So, so we don't like null spaces. And when I did here first, I thought, this is strange. Why is there a null space? It's not supposed to be a null space. If I look at the physics set up here, I don't expect there to be a null space. But there's a numerical null space, and it turned out that that null space there is due to the particular way I discretized it and then due to rounding errors in the computations. It, had, it does not come from the physics. So with this other discretization here, with a change of variable, suddenly I avoid the null space. So I thought that was interesting. I, I'm going to put that in the book because it's interesting, you know, for inspiration. Right. And then we arrive at this here. So anyway, we already discussed this a little bit. And the interesting thing is that the more SVD components you include, it's like the, the deeper you can see into the ground. So that's interesting. And in particular here, with, 80, with, a, with a low noise level and 80 SVD components, we can definitely see the two first bumps, and, and then I, I'm not so sure what happens. Right, so there must be something systematic going on here. Somehow, uh, how deep you can look into the ground is related to how many SVD components you include. And then, of course, we know that how many SVD components we can use depends on the noise level. With more noise, we can only include fewer SVD components. So it turns out that by means of the singular value decomposition, and in particular, if we look at the singular vectors, then we can actually say something about how deep into the painting we can see. So that's basically what I say there. So here are the right singular vectors of, the, uh, of this particular problem. And remember, for truncated SVD, Our TSVD solution is a sum from 1 to k, ui transpose b sigma i vi. Okay, so the v vectors are the basis vectors, and whatever we reconstruct is the sum of the v vectors. So whatever features are in the v vectors will be brought over to the, to the solution, right? So what do we see? Well, we see that this, there's an interesting progression now in these singular vectors. Usually we have this feature with more and more oscillations as, as the index gets higher, but that's not quite what we see here. We see something else. The, the, here's, here's singular vector number 10, okay? So it, is, it has oscillations here, 
in the left part that corresponds to the to the top layers and from a certain point essentially this this vector here becomes zero and of course v1 v2 v3 and so so forth the ones i don't show you have precisely the same feature that they they have zero elements here in the right part and if you go here then to v20 the 20s singular vector you see now zero start to appear in the left part and we still have zeros over here in the right part so if we sum if we make a sum of say the first 20 SVD components there's no way that we can reconstruct anything in essentially the right part of the interval because all the V vectors that we're summing have zeros in that part okay so so with a small number of SVD components we can just not look deep into the ground we can only see the surface layers and sure enough that's of course precisely what we see in this plot here and then as we increase the index of the singular vectors you see that this region here where we have something non-zero going on it shifts further and further to the right that means deeper and deeper in, into the painting here huh so isn't that interesting and it shifts in a very systematic way so so how far we can look into into the object you can actually determine determine that if you know the noise level because if you know the noise level or if you have an estimate of the noise level then you can figure out how many SVD components can I include right because you know the noise level determines the regularization parameter K and then once you have your K you can look at these guys here and you say okay maybe my maybe I can include 50 50 uh, uh, SVD components that means that I build up I build up solutions in terms of vectors that look like this and then you can for certainly say that until around this depth here of maybe point, point 0.6 something like that you should you, you should have a, 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 a good resolution but beyond that beyond that you know you may not be able to recover something anything out there because all these vectors are basically zero out there so uh, wow so the message of this example here was was twofold one was to illustrate that uh, a variable transformation was a good idea and the other is that it's it's sometimes really really interesting to look at the right singular vectors the basis for the regularized solution because they can give you some some really cool and interesting information that might be useful when you do a reconstruction okay we're going to finish here